Job 23 and verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Father, we pray your blessing upon the reading of your word. We pray, God, that you might minister in our hearts through it. I pray that you would take this time and comfort hearts and help us to get our perspective and worldview in line with yours. We pray that you would give us an understanding of your word collectively today, that we might honor you as a body of believers and trust you more fully, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. This verse was one that I memorized in 1977. You say, well, how do you know it was 1977? Well, I was in my senior year of Bible college in 1977, and our senior class memorized this verse as a class. And we recited it whenever we would have class meetings. He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That is a verse that I would encourage you to memorize if you have not. It was, it's been a verse that I, was, I have been glad over and over that I, that I had committed it to memory. God has used it many times when things looked chaotic and confusing in my life. When nothing made sense, my mind would go to this passage of Scripture. This precious verse has not always been an easy verse to hang on to when life gets crazy or confusing or when you're ill. When I was in my 20s, I had an elderly friend. This lady truly loved the Lord, but she had terrible health. And the fact is, she was dying slowly. I visited her in the hospital and at that particular time, and this wasn't all the time with her, but at that particular time, she was kind of at a low point and struggling a bit spiritually. And I remember her saying to me, it is hard to be spiritual with your head in a bucket. <laughs> she had kind of a Kentucky humor about her. But I know that even in the midst of her illness, her sickness, she would have signed her name to this verse. She would have claimed it. Now, it is hard to understand at times why God allows certain troubles to come into our lives. I believe with all my heart the sovereignty of God, but it is not always easy. There are people that are struggling now in t this time of disease and pandemic. I feel badly for them. They have nothing to hang their hat on. Their worldview is godless, and when that happens, when, th when you are godless in your worldview, you are existential by default. That... Suffering becomes meaningless, and life becomes purposeless. Here is a pearl for you. Earthly life often doesn't go well. Often doesn't. That is life. That is how it goes. Most of us are not going to survive life. There's profundity here. You know, if you listen closely... Job was a vivid example of someone who had encountered incredible and intense and dramatic suffering. It had not always been that way. Life had been pretty good for him. In fact, he was a successful man, apparently very wealthy, 
very large family, a lot of stuff. By earthly standards, he was a very blessed man, very rich man. He was a man also who loved the Lord and tried to live for the Lord. But he got noticed. If you know the story of Job, Satan noticed Job as well, and Job became the the subject of a cosmic conversation between God and Satan, where Satan accuses Job and says, well, God, the only, only reason Job's serving you is because you've blessed him so much. You have given him so many perks that this is why he serves you the way he does. And so if you read the early chapter of Job, God says to Job, okay, I'll give you some rope. I'll give you some leniency to deal with him, only you can't kill him. And so great heartache came within Job's life. Job lost all of his possessions. Job lost his family. He he knows, he, he knew in a very dramatic and traumatic way what it meant to experience grief. Compounded many times over. And it is in the middle of that heartache and that grief and that devastation that he utters these words. These are very profound when you consider the context. He knoweth the way that I take When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Now that assertion on Job's part rested upon believing some truths in this verse. And that's what I want us to focus in on. There are three basic truths in this verse that Job believed in order for him to make a statement like that. And the first one was this. He believed the consciousness and cognizance of God. Now what that means is that Job believed that God was a conscious, sentient being that knew him. Cognizance means that he knew Job. Know all about him. Now, why do you say that? Well, because God is not a force. God is not some nebulous power out there in the cosmos. God is a personal being. God is a conscious being. God is a cognizant being. He knows. Our founding, some, very few in fact, but some of our founding fathers were, were what is known as deists. And essentially a deist is someone that thinks that God created everything and then just backed off and watched. He was the great watcher. They describe him sometime as a clock winder that he, young people, years ago, clocks had to be wound, okay? Just, they weren't solar. You know, he didn't have batteries. He had to wind them. And so God is the great clock winder, and he's winding up the alarm clock, and he sits it there on the, on, the, on the stand, and then he just watches after he wound things up. That's what deists essentially believe about God. That is not the God of the Bible. He knoweth the way that I take. God knows what is happening. And latent within that means that because he knows, we can trust him. In England, there was an old custom that used to be practiced, and I am told still is at a certain east coast town in Britain. When a ship is about to sail, the captain asks his men, Are we all here? And they replied, Yes, sir, and in God's care. 
Then the captain asks, is there anything then to fear? And they answer, no, sir, nothing. And then they set sail. Job is expressing that God, the conscious and cognizant God, knows what's happening to him. Psalm 20, excuse me, Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. God knows. God is personal. God knew Job. God knew David. God knows you. God is individually interested in you. He can do that, by the way. He can have a personal relationship with each one of us individually, even though there's a lot of us. He knows. He knows what is happening. He knows when we don't know, which is often. Someone wrote, I do not know. I cannot see what God's kind hand prepares for me. Nor can my glance pierce through the haze which covers all my future ways. But yet I know that o'er it all rules he who notes the sparrow's fall. God knows the way that I take. What a joy to know that God knows how it's all going to come out. God is not alarmed. God is not panicked. God does not wring his hands wondering what's going to happen. You know, if you can picture a scary movie that you've seen before, but now you are seeing it with a friend. The person you are with has never seen this, this flick And they're all tense as the heroine walks down the dark, dismal corridor where around the corner a giant spider waits ominously for the unsuspecting girl. The tension builds as saliva drops in a puddle from the spider's mandible as the girl makes her way down the dimly lit hallway. And then all of a sudden she screams. And your friend covers her eyes. But you know what? You've seen it before. You know what happens. Now, just in case you're wondering, the hero comes in, saves the girl, and blows the spider up with a hand grenade. I didn't want you thinking about how it ended, all right? That's, that's how it ended. But the fact is, your friend was alarmed. You weren't. Why? Because you knew what had happened. This is God. God knows the way that I take. When you don't know, which is often, he does. Nothing comes as a surprise to him. Three quarters of what we worry about is because we're not, we don't know what's going to happen next. God knows what is happening. He knows where I am going. He knows the way. That word way is simply the word that they use for road. He knows the way that I take, the road. People guess at that. Sometimes people look back over their lives and they they want to believe that every choice has been a good choice and the the way they've chosen is is the right way. And sometimes in retrospect, they kind of convince themselves, yes, yes, I did everything right. There's There's a poem by Robert Frost that kind of expresses that. You may have heard this. It's, it's called The Road Not Taken. You know the poem where he says, uh, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, it's just as fair. And having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted where, though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. (laughs) Oh, I kept the first for another day, but knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh some day, ages and ages hence, How two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. You know what I say? Phooey. 
That's guesswork. It's, it's retrospect, looking back, hoping that things were right. The gist of that poem is that he hoped he made the right choices in life and was trying to convince himself that he had. But friend, if you trust the Lord, you will be exactly where you need to be. Job believed that God was conscious of him and cognizant of him and was well aware and active. He believed the consciousness and cognizance of God. And there's another thing here, and it's, I've already alluded to it, and it's connected but he, he believed the care and attentiveness of God as well. Now, God can know all about you and not be care, caring for you. He could be that way, but he's not, okay? But in terms of, is that an option? Can someone know you well and not care anything about what happens to you? Yes. So God does not simply know everything. He cares about you. That means God's personal interest is in you. Job 23.10 says, He knoweth the way that I take. Notice the personal pronoun there. He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me. These are personal pronouns. David used similar language in 1 Chronicles 29.17. He said, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart Talking about his heart. You work in the, in the realm of the heart. And notice that he says, you try me. God has a reason why he is working in, in, in Job's life, and that is because he has a personal interest in Job's life. Scripture tells me that the Lord does not try the wicked. The Lord trieth the righteous, Psalm 11, verse 5, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. God does not work per se in terms of trying the heart of unsaved people, but he does save people. And that word try is not the element of of some kind of vindictive gauntlet that people have to run through. In fact, that word try is used later in the book of Job in chapter 34 and verse 3. It says, for the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth food. I don't know if you're one of those persnickety individuals that won't try new things. You don't need to raise your hand if you're one of those. I, whenever we've traveled, we've traveled to a lot of foreign countries, and I have seen food that I have no Never tried it before, never, never had a clue about it, but I'll try it, as long as it's not moving. If it's, if it's wiggling, not trying it. But if it's fairly cooked, you know, you know I'll, give it a, I'll give it a try most times. Job 34.3 says, For the ear trieth words as the mouth tastes food. That's the word, the same word when, God, when Job says, When you have tried me, tested me, I will come forth as gold. So this passage here is talking about the the care of God, that God has so much of an interest in Job's life that he's allowing him to go through a certain kind of thing because of God's unique relationship with him. The psalmist invited that. Psalm 26, verse 2, examine me, O Lord, try me is the word. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Try my, the reins are the will. You guide a horse with reins, that's the will. He says, test my will and my heart. Psalm 139, verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. He's inviting God to invade his life, to saturate his life, and put him to the test. And again, this is not some kind of, it's not some, some, some kind of sadistic thing. You know, with, with a coach who has a, a great athlete, he will, 
he will push that athlete. Sometimes the coach will, will, will say to them, today we are going to put you through your paces. Today we're going to see what you're made of. That's not done as punishment. When God blesses us with plenty, it is evidence of his love and concern for us. When he says, when he sends adversity, it is evidence of his love and concern for us. There's no distinctions between material and physical blessings and adversity. They're both, they're both there for the same reason. Now I'll confess, I, I would prefer easy over hard. If there's, you know, most of us, if there's an easy way and a hard way, most of us are going to choose the easy way. But God knows that that's not how people are built. That's not how believers, that's not how Christians are built. And when we're in the thick of it, we may not know why. Now, Scripture does give us, in some instances, why God put people through various things. And sometimes God's purposes will be very plain, and other times, and perhaps most times, you will never find out what he's doing until you get to glory. And I will tell you, you will drive yourself crazy if you spend your waking moments trying to figure that out. Or you can drive yourself embittered and cynical. But friend, you can know that when God is active in a person's life, It is out of care and concern, even if you do not understand it, even if it hurts. So, you have the consciousness and cognizance of God in this verse. You have the care and attentiveness of God. And then you have the design and objective of God. And the first objective is to bring you through it, to bring you through it. Notice what Job says. When I am tried, I shall come forth. Now understand, he's not coming forth right at that present moment. (laughs) That was future. But what he's expressing here is, well, yes, I am in this situation now, but I'm not going to stay here. This is not where God's going to leave me. I'm coming out of this at some point. I shall come forth. God's purpose is not to destroy you or to leave you sidelined or leave you in a crumpled heap, but to bring you forth. And you may be defeated right now. I don't know everyone's individual circumstances. You may have gotten some terrible news this past week. You may be de- feel defeated right now. And you may be asking yourself, God, why have you put me in this situation? But if Job's life is any paradigm, which I believe it is, his purpose is for you, is to bring you through this. I shall come forth. I will emerge from this eventually. Job knew where he was at that at that time was not where he was going to stay. There is a confidence expressed here that, yeah, this is horrible now, but that's not where I'm staying. And when I come out, I am going to come forth as what? Gold. So not only was he not going to stay there when he came out of that, he was going to come out as something improved than what he was currently. To make you of maximum value. To bring you through, to make you of maximum value. And since this is a forging term, talking about trying as gold, this is a forging term, the purpose is to purify you. I shall come forth as gold. It's, it's similar to what Malachi chapter 3, verse 31 says, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. 
I don't know if you've ever melted metal down, raw metal, heated it up in its molten shape, molten form, and then skimmed the impurities off the top as that metal heats up, the impurities rise, and it, it, it forms, sometimes it'll form a crust on top called slag, and that is skimmed off by the, by the refiner. All of gold mining is a process of purification from the beginning when it is dug out of the earth in its raw form and, and permeated with grit and stone and other things until the time that it's made into a piece of jewelry. It's all a process of purifying. Someone said this, let's suppose you're literally living on top of a gold mine. But the gold you dig up is embedded in rock and dirt, so what do you do? You put it in a hot furnace. The intense heat burns and separates every particle of impurity or alloy, leaving only the pure metal. That's how you refine gold. And folks, that's how God refines us. He uses the flame of suffering to refine us and make us better. Sometimes he uses suffering to purge a particular sin out of our lives or prepare us for a future task or strengthen our faith or develop and build our character. But the bottom line is he uses suffering to refine us and make us better. He knows that we'll never grow and develop into the people he wants us to be if we don't go through those struggles and exercise our faith. That is why he tests us, unquote. I would prefer the process be always enjoyable, but it doesn't work that way. Not to get the best results, it doesn't. There was a group of people traveling through a furniture factory, a very large, large factory. They made, they made quality furniture, you know, out of wood and not plastic and compacted wood. So these guests were on a tour through the, fac the, the facility, and the tour guide stopped at a certain piece of furniture. It was superbly grained and figured, and he said, I want you to observe the beauty of this oak. It is the finest selected timber of its kind. The secret of the intricate and beautiful graining is this, that the trees from which it was taken grew in a spot where they were exposed to almost constant conflict with storms. You know, many people admire gold pendants and artistry, but they forget that those designs had to be beaten and etched into the brooch or the medallion. When God takes you through the fire, it is for purification purposes, and it is for utilization purposes. When you think of gold, I mean... I don't know why my mind would go there, but when I would think of gold, I think pirates, you know, and chests of gold buried somewhere. Just all of this gold coins in big piles or in bags somewhere, or in the vault at Fort Knox in big ingots. How many times have you, have you used the word ingot? That's, that's a word we just don't use very often, right? I got to say ingot today. But you picture it as being stored somewhere. That's not the purpose of gold. The purpose of gold is practical. It is useful. It's, it's, not, it's not only currency. It's been made into beautiful pieces of art. I've been in some buildings that have had gold. I mean, it's <laughs> real. It's not just paint. God is not hoarding gold. God, when he creates gold in you, he is, using, he is creating that in you to be utilized and to be useful. It's the usefulness of it that makes it valuable. Now, God allows or even brings adversity into our lives to mold us and purify us to make us useful. So, you should not be shocked and surprised if that's what he allows into your life. Cindy was 
teaching a lesson to some little kids some time ago, and she was talking about, I think she was talking about David running from Saul, and she asked the kids to think about their troubles and ask God to give them strength in the troubles, and one little girl thought and said, I can't think of any troubles. So Cindy said, let's pray about the ones you're going to have. I mean, you may not have them right now, but I can guarantee you, you probably will. And it's how you see those things, really, in many respects. It's the worldview of those things. It will make the difference. And this is the way God has always dealt with his people. You know, you think of various instances in the scripture. The man born, born blind talked about in John chapter 9. You remember the disciples came to Jesus and master, said, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said this, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. God wants to make his works manifest in you. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, it's recorded there that he asked God three times to remove a thorn in his flesh. Three times he begged God, take this out of my life. And God said, no, this is, this is necessary for you. He, Paul called it, called it the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Part of the reason he had that was to keep him humble enough to be used. And then, of course, the Lord Jesus. Talk about trouble. In Acts chapter 2, I believe it's Peter preaching, and he's telling unbelieving individuals, talking about Jesus, he said, he says in verse 23, him, talking about Jesus, being delivered by the Determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. By the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now he's not, he's not removing the responsibility from those people for what they did, but he said what God the Father did by his own choice was put Jesus in a position to be crucified and slain. Why? For you. And I guarantee you, he came forth. <laughs> he came forth in resurrection. In the very suffering of the Lord Jesus, we see the redemption and forgiveness and eternal life provided. So, here are some facts. Fact one, God allows his children to go, to go through trails of trials. Fact two, he not only allows it, he initiates it. I have a book in my library called How to Handle Adversity, and one of the contentions was God sends it. He sends it. Fact three, God brings trials in order to gain maximum value out of our lives. That's the reason. Sometimes it's very surprising. There was a home up north that was for mentally handicapped um, Individuals, not up north, I want to say it was in Wisconsin. And they have since shifted gears. They, they have, they're still dealing with the mentally handicapped, but just in a, in a, not in the way they used to. But back in those days, they would receive mentally handicapped people who were virtually incapable of functioning. And there was a man, he was not a Christian, he was an unsaved man, brought his son up to this place because at that time, in, in, and this was talk, like 40 years ago, they didn't have facilities like they do now. So there, this man was getting older. He didn't know how he was going to continue to care for this grown son. And, and this, this young man, um, I mean, virtually had to be led by the hand and, and bathed and fed and cared for in every way. And so the man brought him up there, and he said, can you help me? And they said, yes. And the director and he were talking, and he, he said, well, while you're here, why don't you go and visit one of the churches here in town? And so the guy did. Went into a gospel preaching church, heard the gospel, went forward, and was dramatically saved. He came back, this man came back to visit his son at this facility, 
and said this, I thank God for my boy. I thank God for the way God gave me my boy. Because I never would have come here and gone to church and gotten saved. Listen, that was a hard way. But it was a necessary way. And some of you may be going through the valley just now. I do not know. You may be in grief. You may be... In sorrow, you may have been told some terrible news by the doctor this past week. I don't know what may be going on in your life. And you may be going through a hard way. But I want you to know that God is not flippant. God is not, God is not ambivalent towards you. And though your way may be very, very hard, God still has his purposes within this. And whether or not you feel it, because I don't think Job, at the time that he spoke those words, was necessarily feeling it. Because this is, this is at the very lowest of, a, of the low of his life where he said these words. May not have felt it, but he knew it was so. I shall come forth. <laughs> I'm not there. But I will. And when I do, I'm coming forth as gold. Edith Lillian Young wrote a poem, a very profound poem. Disappointment, his appointment. Change one letter. Then I see that the thwarting of my purpose is God's better choice for me. His appointment must be blessing, though it may come in disguise, for the end from the beginning open to his vision lies. Disappointment, his appointment. Who's the Lord who loves me best, understands and knows me fully, who my faith and love would test? For like loving earthly parents, he rejoices when he knows that his child accepts unquestioned all that from his wisdom flows. Disappointment, his appointment. No good things will he withhold from denials. Oft we gather treasures of his love untold. Well he knows each broken purpose leads to a fuller, deeper trust. And in the end of all his dealings proves our God is wise and just. Disappointment, his appointment. Lord, I take it then as such. Like clay in the hands of the potter yielding wholly to his touch. My life's plan is all his molding, not one single choice be mine. Let me answer unrepining, Father, not my will, but thine, not my will, but thine. Our God and Father, we thank you for our time together as we've taken these moments and dwelt upon this word from you. I pray, God, that if that if someone's going through the refining process right now, that God, you would help them to lay hold upon truth that they may not feel at the moment, but can lay hold on now for the future. Father, I know that you know what is happening. I know that you have purposes for all of us. And I pray for these folks here, especially if there's anyone that doesn't know the Savior. What, what do they have to trust in? And I pray, Father, if there's anybody here that doesn't know the Savior, that they would come to know you personally. But I pray that this might be a moment of decision for these that may be going through some trials. I pray this in Jesus' name. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe if you are being challenged in your life, maybe right now, you should pray, God, I know that you know what is happening. I know that you have purposes in mind for me and 
in, for this and for me that I do not understand. But I claim your promise that there is, that this is to achieve in me purity and usefulness. And though it's hard to feel this, I believe this, that I will come forth from this. And by your grace, I will do that, trusting you.